So channels can be done with round stones as well as these square stones, which are baguettes. Um, but it's just standardly done, quite often done with a baguette. We're going to switch topics. This is called a wire mount. This is a setting that's also really standard in the industry, and you can buy blanks for it. You can buy blanks for channel set stones and buy blanks for wire mounts in Rio, <coughs> Swiss, and Romanov, and you name it. However, I have some opinions I'll probably share about doing that. Um, so I'm going to show you how to make a wire mount. It's the one on the top of the wire mount. Up here. With the little wires on the sides and the wires that go between the stones. <coughs> it's a really fun setting to do. So let's look at my example, if we can focus in on this. And what's nice about doing it yourself, besides the fact that you don't have to have stones that are so standardized that they fit in the setting, is that you can do it in the middle of a bar, you can do it in a pendant, you can do it in a brooch, you can do it anywhere. Whereas when you buy those <coughs> pre-cut um, samples or, or um, rings or whatever, they're very standardized and you have to do what it's set up to do. So that's the wire mount. <coughs> now, the other thing I said I was going to cover today is this four-prong setting with a round, brilliant cut stone. And a brilliant cut is, actually, it's not even the most contemporary cut anymore. Does anybody remember the name of the newest cut in diamonds? There was a new cut to get even more sparkle out. Oh, it's called like... Radiant? Radiant. Is it? Or Millennium or something? I mean, something like that, you know. The biggest thing since sliced bread kind of thing. And, and this is a round brilliant, which was the standard until just recently. And um, it has, you can set it in four prongs very easily even this size, although this is a ridiculous size. It's like eight millimeters, so you can imagine if this is really a diamond, <laughs> what we'd be talking about. But I wanted something big so you could see it. So why don't we go to the slides. I hate to do this, but it'll be fast. There's not a lot of them. And you'll need to take notes on the wire mounts because I'm not <coughs> having any hands yeah. Okay, so this is a, a side view of a round million cut stone. And in your handout, I do have a couple of pages about uh, stone, different characteristics and qualities of stones. And one of the things that you have to know, besides the cut of the stone, is how hard the stone is when you're setting. So I typically don't set stones that are softer than number seven on the Mohs scale, which is the scale devised by Friedrich Moe, which rates minerals in terms of their hardness, and not in terms of their toughness, though. So that's the second thing that you have to know about a stone. So seven is a fairly hard stone. And 7 to 10 would be the hardest stones on the most scale. The most scale goes from 1 to 10. 10 being diamond being the hardest material. And uh, 1 being talc, which we don't want to do. So uh, 7 and above, which is basically quartz. You know, I'm happy to set quartz in a four-prong setting. Um, amethyst, citrine, garnet, any of those things. And of course, diamonds are the easiest to deal with because they're both hard and tough. So the second aspect of that is toughness back of your handout, the chart has all these different titles. Um, it's a graph, and one of the titles is the toughness rating of the stone, the other one is the hardness rating, another one is um, how it responds to ultrasound cleaning, and another one is how it responds to polishing. So when you're out, you know, looking for a stone to set, if you don't know this information already, this might be of some use to you. And the other thing is, is how the stone is cut. And I'm going to be talking about the girdle of a stone, the table of a stone, and the cubit of a stone. So we need to know what those are. This is the girdle. Or am I talking to an audience who knows like everything? No. no. Okay. <laughs> this is the girdle of the stone, the outside edge, the widest diameter of the stone. When you buy a stone, you buy it by the girdle measurement. The five millimeter stone is measured at the girdle to be five millimeters. This is the cubit, the bottom part of the stone. And you want to be careful, for instance, when you're doing a ring or you're doing a channel set, that culet is not touching the finger or touching the bottom of the channel, that it's suspended in air. And the diamond is quite sharp. And the top of this is the table facet. I'm going to be talking about where that table facet is in relationship to the top of the channel, in relationship to the top of the prongs. And then this is the pavilion angle, the bottom angle of the stone. This is the crown angle, the top angle of the stone. I'm actually going to do some work where I cut in relationship to those angles and set that stone right in place in that cut. So those are the things that, if you can sort of memorize them right now, then later on as I'm talking about them, they'll make sense. But in, I don't know if your hands, I don't think I have any drawings in your handouts. So you might draw this down and mark those items.
Um, the other thing that I'm going to be talking about is the bezel facet, which comes off of the crown angle of the stone, right off of the girdle. And that's the strongest facet on that stone, and that's where I'm going to try to place my prongs when I do the prong setting. That's where you want to put your prongs. It's on the bezel facet. It's also called a kite facet, I think because it's sort of kite shape. So there are about eight of them, and when you're setting a four prong setting on a round brilliant cut stone, you can get your four prongs on four of those eight facets. <coughs> And the rest of these are just kind of um, little pieces of information about how the light is reflected through a stone, or refracted through the stone. White light comes in, one of these diamonds, and comes out as the rainbow colors. And the cut has everything to do with how successful that is. So it's important that it's cut correctly. Next one, yeah. And in here, you can see it bouncing around inside the stone and coming out from the various rainbow colors. <coughs> And then these are different kinds of cuts of stones. Um, standard brilliant cut, an emerald cut. I've had a lot of people look at emerald cuts. A cushion shape or that rectangular where the edges knocked off. Um, and a king cut, different things you might not be seeing so much these days. You know that one? And then this one shows, and this is, this is the reason I have this slide. It shows what happens to the light when the cut isn't correct, but there's also something else that happens. When you're trying to set this stone and the cut is not correct, it's a real problem. So you want to make sure that when you pick a stone out, that it's not cut too short in this dimension. Quite often it's difficult to deal with a crown angle on a stone like that, at least for me it has to be. And of course the pavilion angle is much steeper than it should be. Or if it's cut too deeply, also it can be a problem. And then the two other areas that you should really be cognizant of when you're buying a stone is the thickness of the girdle and the shape of the girdle. If the girdle is really thin, if this were really the girdle on this stone, it would be a knife edge girdle, and it can chip very easily at that place when you set it, and especially in something like a channel setting, but of course in a prong setting, you push that prong over and your little stone just chips right off. And if your girdle is too fat, then you have some trouble in cutting seats for these stones. So the girdle should be nice and even, and should have these wide parts and smaller parts, and um, even all the way around. Okay, a wire mount. Um, a wire mount is basically a bar. Now you can, you can probably do it by soldering a bunch of tubes together, but I tried that. This seems easy to me. So you basically start out with a bar that is the same millimeter size as your stone. So if I'm dealing with a three millimeter size stone, I'm dealing with a three millimeter size bar for the closest to it. And lately, when I've ordered this from Rio, they give me 3.1 and 3.2 millimeter square rod stuff, which is perfectly fine for this procedure. And 20 gauge, at that size, 20 gauge wire. So that's the relationship between the size of the wire and the size of the bar. You can do a wire mount with any size. You just match your stone to your bar. And make sure that the wires that go between are not too heavy. 20 gauge wires? For the three millimeter bar. So what's the ratio? I don't know what standardized ratio. And I would probably use, even for the next like, like four millimeter bar, I'd still probably use 20 gauge. So you would keep it for a couple of sizes and then you would have it if it gets a lot larger. Maybe I'm not sure I understood you. That bar is something that you work from? Real, yeah. yeah. Square, sterling, or rod stock that's made from it. Well done. Mm -hmm. They sell it. It's a standardized product. Square wire? Square, mm -hmm. square rod. Um, it's in their, their bindings. Their, what used to be river gems. I can't follow you anymore. It's not <laughs> just square wire. It's um, and they consider it too big and too big and too big and it's in the same section and get more. But any, any supplier can supply you. Hauser and Miller can supply you with square rod stock. You have to order it by its millimeter size. And um, <coughs> I don't know who orders from Hoover and Strong. I'm sure they do the same thing. You know, any of the suppliers. I don't know if Swiss can. I haven't, I don't know if anybody's ordered from Swiss something like this. They like the Hoover and Strong. Yeah. Or you can take your round rod and roll it through the room, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And make it square. Basically, what you want to do is produce for yourself some square rod stock that's the same dimension all the way around. It's three millimeters square. Um, so, those are three synthetic stones. 
I highly recommend in any stone setting that you practice with synthetics, and I try to buy synthetics that are as close to um, a coronal or diamond as I can get, and a lot of times they have spinels. There are synthetic spinels pretending to be synthetic emeralds or whatever. Um, whatever you buy, just make sure that it's very high in the most scale, it's a strong stone, and they're very inexpensive, and I buy lots of extra. Okay, so the process is that I've got to map out where those stones go, and they virtually touch each other. So I take a pair of dividers, and the first thing I do is, and you can't see it too well on the slide, is scribe a line right down the center of the bar. And then I figure where I'm going to start. And what I'm doing is measuring the diameter of the stone, and I'm going to mark a point that is equal to the culet of the stone, or the center of the stone, and I'm going to mark all the centers. So I just take a pair of dividers, I make a dimple or a center punch mark, and I measure the stone with the dividers, and I start with one leg of the divider in that mark, and then I just keep making arcs to represent the center of each stone. So they're equally distant apart. They're the dimension of the girdle apart. And what you've marked is the culet. And do you, do you say do you have the stones touching that one? Yeah, they're all touching. This one, they're touching. Is that clear? So here they are. They're the arcs. And here's the stone sitting on that mark, and that stone sitting on that mark. So these arcs cross the center line. Where it crosses right there is where I'm going to put a center punch mark. The finest center punch I can get. If anybody has ever center punched this stock, it tends to warp a little bit. So you want to do a very light little dimple mark to catch your drill bit. Now, I'm going to drill right where that mark is, all the way through the rod for each stone. And I want to drill in stages, a small hole first, and then a little larger, and a little larger, and the end hole, you know, I didn't measure that end hole, but the end hole is not as wide as the stone. And when you see the example, maybe come up afterwards and see the example, you can see the size of the holes. Don't want it as wide as the stone, but you want it big enough so that dirt can't get caught in there and be impossible to get out, and so that light comes through the stone from the back side. But if you make it too big a hole, it'll make your rod weak. So I would be a little bit smaller rather than too large. So I have a couple of the drill bits there. And the reason I like to start out with a really tiny hole first is it helps me line up those drill bits. You've got to get those holes lined up perfectly in the center of that rod. Okay. So bigger holes. And these are three millimeter stones, so it gives you an idea. Actually, it looks a lot larger, doesn't it? It's not the hole. It's just <laughs> Next one. Now I want to choose a three millimeter high speed setting burr to cut the seat for this stone. And don't, I, I never use those vanadium. I don't know if anybody uses those vanadium burrs, but I don't recommend them. The high speed burrs, setting burrs, work out really well. Um, and I cut the seat so that the girdle, the bottom part of the girdle, will be sitting on the very top of this setting. So the girdle has some dimension. You can't just say the girdle's sitting on there. The bottom part of the girdle is sitting on the top of the rod, just at the top of the rod. So the whole of the pavilion angle is sunken into the rod. Okay? And you can see these, how close these settings are. <coughs> There's just room there for the girdle to touch. Megan, will you back up just one second to get sure. out the size of the uh, hole that you're drilling? Mm -hmm. You can see it in here. Yeah. That's a millimeter. <laughs> I told you I didn't, I forgot to measure that millimeter, and I'll measure it when I go up to the desk. But, but you gauge that on, how do you gauge what size it should be? Mm -hmm. um, you just don't, you don't want your stone to fall through. Now these 
These are drilled all at the same time. I'm going to set four in this rod. And this is a side view. This one isn't down far enough. This one's down far enough. Can you see the difference? And you see how they're, they're drilled, so just the top of the rod is getting cut a little bit. So what are you doing? Do you just let them go too far? Yeah. You have to file the whole rod down mm -hmm. and then recut all the seams. Mm -hmm. It's hard so to slip if you've ever cut this thick rod. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be fine. Okay, the next thing you do is start to file in between. And this I usually make a little mark straight across the top so I can sight it <coughs> in between the stones. And file with a triangular file. Now if I'd done this in demo, this is not a fast technique. If I'd done this in demo in order to show everybody, this would have taken the entire period. So I think it's faster in slides. <laughs> but if it's more confusing, just ask me questions. I'm filing both sides. Right here you just see one side filed, but both sides get filed. You want to give the illusion that this is a series of twos that have been joined together. So that's your goal here. So you start out with a triangular file. Then I go to a series of different kinds of files, whatever works. Um, I have you know, a half round file, a small file that I use to start carving around. So I'm carving around in between those areas that I filed out with a triangular file. And I also use barrette files a lot. Small barrette files are my favorites. And I'll start out with a number two cut and go to a number four cut for finishing. Are you carving like underneath it all? No, it's straight. It's straight. No, uh -huh. it's straight. You'll see the back the slide. So I carve both sides so that they go around like little cups. The fun part is what you do with the rest of this rod. You can do all kinds of fancy carving with the rest of this rod. And right here, I have to file this away in order to fit the wire that goes in there. So the rod can't come straight down and go right in to this area. And there you can see what's happening from the front. Nice picture. Huh? Nice picture. Yeah, you slide the grade. Oh, thanks. Yeah. And you can see the file in there. Mm -hmm. um, so, you can see that it's tapered in here a little bit and tapered in here, and that's where the wire is going to go on the very end. Well, here I'm forming the 20 gauge wire. But before I form that wire, what you can't see is that I went in there and I polished the sides of the rod. I polished right into those recessed areas because if you, um, that's a really, it's really pretty. It looks a little better. Yeah, it does. If you let that go and you go ahead and solder your rods and you won't be able to get between the rod and that indentation around those little tubing areas to clean up. So I take a little hard felt wheel for the flexible shaft that's a knife edge, hard pressed felt. And I use Tripoli and white diamonds and I don't bother with the rouge at this point. So the hard pressed felt wheels I have here and I use them a lot on the flexible shaft. Those of you who don't have a flexible shaft, it's not something, the um, dremels don't go fast enough for this, for this process. For polishing this, if you're going to do it by hand, then I would just do it all with sandpaper down to about 600, 800 gray. Okay. Actually, could you go back to the one thing? This pair of pliers is my favorite pair of pliers. And they're really terrific for bending this particular kind of wire in mean, this shape, the U shape. And you've got to bend that U shape. Um, let's see how to point this out. This U could be sticking straight out really far from the top. What you want is for it to be very close to the base, but you still want to see some light through it. Because if it's sticking up too high, it's going to fold over the stone in the end, in the end process. You want it high enough so that the girdle can slip under it, but not so high that it will fold over the stone. And all of them have to be bent like that and then slip tightly between these tubes. So what kind of pliers is that? It's, um, I don't know. Round on that side, flat on the other Yeah, other. they are. Flat on that side and they're almost round. They're a little bit oval on the so other side. So they flat on the inside? Only at one point are they flat on the inside. Only with that round part. Mm -hmm. I have them here. Now I'm soldering them from the back, and I'm soldering them in a magnesia block, which I brought to show you. And the magnesia block is what I use for doing wire settings, for soldering my wire settings um, 
it, I can stick the wire inside the block and it holds it firmly. It's very nice, so I'll show you that. And you can get them at Swaz, Rio, whatever. And I'm soldering, I'm poker soldering, pick soldering, wherever people describe it, where I picked up a ball of solder on the end of this poker, I heated the piece up, and I run the solder, I touch the rod here, and I pull the solder down with the torch. It's very important how you apply the solder. If you apply the solder to the side, you'll have fillets of solder down the side of your rod. And they're a pain to clean up. So I apply the solder to the top here of the rod, and I allow the rod to act um, like a conduit for that solder to flow down. And like by capillary action, the solder's gonna jump around the rod and flow down between the bar and the rod. So you apply it to the outside of the rod? Yeah, right to the side edge, yeah. even to the outside. And it just, it goes right in. As long as it's making some contact with that joint there, it'll go right in. So the curved part of the U, you poked? I poked it down to the magnesium block, so it's holding those curves exactly where I want them to be. How can you tell? It seems like there would be, it would be hard to get them all like that. Well, I have some, I have them forced up on the sides of this. And they can't really go down any farther. So if you push it down in the block, it seems to work out pretty well. And that's the back. So the rods have been cut off and filed down. And what you want is something like this, where the rod is just this extension on the back plate. And you can't really see the difference. So I solder it with hard solder. So I had very little color change. It's a strong connection. <coughs> And then this is the, the setting process. Of course, you do clean up after you solder those rods on and do some polishing. And then you start putting your stones in. And this one's out, but these are in. And they should all line up really straight. It just says it just drops straight down between the two You wires. rock them in. Pardon me? You rock them in between the two wires. They don't drop anymore afterwards? No, surprisingly. After you get done. Yeah. <laughs> Now they're all in, in this bar, but I'm actually, I don't know what happens. The next one I think is a different, a different bar I want to sort of pass them around. <laughs> Describe a little bit more the rocking in, is it, is it this way? You're it's sliding it under one wire, and then it goes right into the seat. So you snap it in? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Put some pretty substantial pressure on it. So then you don't have to do much other thing than a wire once. I mean, you don't. Oh, no, you do. Or you, you do. go on. Mm -hmm. This is a really weird coil. <laughs> to hammer down on the top of the wires. And I brought the punches for you to see. It's just a rod of steel, and it has a softened rectangular face on it. So I like the rectangular form for this, because you're not going to hit the stones on the side when you're punching down the wire. And I tend to punch the wire from the middle out. If you start on one side, you can force your wire over. So I start in the middle and then punch out both ways. And it's a chasing technique basically holding the rod in place and tapping, and you'll see it in, in the channel setting, so you will see an example of this technique. And you're moving your tool across, and you're tapping and moving across. And you're just forming that metal down, and you're also hardening it, and you're giving it a crisp edge. So here you can see it's starting to form down. And I'm starting to develop an edge. And I do that in the beginning with a tool. By hammering down here and then working all the way to the edge there, it actually begins to make it a sharp turn. And now I'm using that hard-pressed felt wheel to polish the wires. So at the very end, you want to polish those wires in between the stone. And 
other questions? <coughs> I don't usually. What I usually do is just file the sides a little bit and clean them up with that hard pressed pellet. The tops, and once it's down, it's really secure. Um, it's a very secure setting, but you'll see, I have a long rod where I have, I practice rods all over the place, and I have one where I cut off the tops of those wires when we get down. Maybe we can sight on that. Um, can you? I'm trying. Well, I'll hold it up when I go over there. Okay. I cut off the tops and I turn them into prongs. Mm -hmm. And I like that one. So I'll I'll hold it up to the camera when I get back there and we have more light. Can we pass it around? Yeah, sure. Okay, the next topic, we're just gonna march on and I'm not used to doing this, but I have to excuse mm -hmm. me. It makes me a little nervous. Usually I do like an all day workshop and we do something. And I was gonna bring you all in some wire mounts to do, but just mm -hmm. tell me. So let's do channel. Uh, the channel ring, I think, went around with the two blue stones in it. That's a really fat channel. Those, those walls are fat. Yeah, it's a stylistic consideration. It's not necessary. You can have much thinner walls as you can see in the other ring that went around. But we're just going to deal with these heavy walls. And this is two. It's a couple of. These are just cast rings, and I'm sure you can tell me all the things that are wrong with these cast rings. <laughs> there are many other things wrong with these cast rings, but they're just things that I throw together. I just cast a whole bunch with my really crappy metal. I mean, it's like full of solder and everything else, but it gives me a chance to practice channel setting. It's something to do with that old silver. Um, gold, of course, is very different than silver. You don't see commercially, at least I don't see commercially, anybody can notice this, but I don't see too much channel setting going on in silver. So gold is a much stiffer material in terms of doing a channel setting. It's nice though. I mean, I enjoy it a lot more because you don't have things warping and moving on you as much as you do with silver. But I always practice with silver. One thing, it's cheaper to cast. And, and um, Revere Academy actually alloys this material for their practice sessions. And this is kind of a bronze, but they alloy it so it'll do what they want. They didn't share that alloy with me, so I didn't alloy it. Now this is um, two five millimeter stones sitting so very close together. It's an open channel, but the technique I'm going to show you is the same technique for a closed channel. And that means a channel that has walls on these sides where it's closed in. Because I'm going to cut individual seats of the channel. And it's quite possible to go in there with a file and create a groove channel all the way across and slide your stones in from the side. And many people do that. When you do that, you want to make sure that those stones can stay secure in that setting. And sometimes, I mean, people, you secure the stones by hammering from the top, but people sometimes raise a bead with an engraver, with a graver, right down the channel. They raise this little piece of metal, like a ball, up against the last stone to hold it in place so it doesn't fall out of the channel. But that's the kind of channel setting that you can kind of read about and do yourselves. It's pretty self-explanatory. Whereas cutting the individual seats is what I want to show today. The first thing you do is you choose your stones, and you choose your stones to be in a straight channel exactly the same size, as close as possible. And you would be surprised about synthetic stones. You would think that human-made stones would be regular and exactly the same size, and they aren't. Um, so when I get a batch of synthetics, I go through them, and I measure them really carefully, and I choose two that match perfectly in terms of their diameters. And then, um, I've marked on my bench top A and B. I've marked on the ring A and B. When I take those stones off and on, they go back to A and they stay in order. What? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought that was the high side. Um, you notice this mark here? You'll see it on the next slide, but it's so strong here, I want to point it out. Um, Actually, this is the mark that's important here. And this is just a result of marking the inside channel where I'm going to cut. And I do that with dividers. And I'll do that in demo. Remember, this one's going to be done in demo. You don't need to see this line. And then this is where the culet goes. And now you can see that inside line a little bit better. And that line, you want your table, that top facet of your stone, to be below the top of your channel walls. 
you're going to be ultimately hammering these down and filing them off. So that's how much you want to remove. So the end channel, as you can see on this stone, the channel walls are almost the same height as the table. Ultimately, I'll take them down to that point. So that's how you set up your dividers. There they are. I don't know why I have so many shots of this. There are the dividers doing their thing. And then I just go straight to cutting that seat. So um, when you cut the seat, these, are, these aren't as many slides as you. Um, okay, so you've got to cut individual seats to hold the girdle of the stone, right in that wall. And I cut those seats with a heart for H-A-R-T, 45 degree um, stone setting heart for. And if you're not careful about ordering a stone setting burr, you can end up with one of these, these um, hand cut burrs. And we had this experience with you where we ended up with a bunch of hand cut burrs, which means that the teeth are irregular. Never emeralds. <laughs> no, I don't know. People do channel set emeralds. 
But you know, a lot of channels are not as wide as this. I mean, this is a <coughs> channel. So anyway, um, I'm tapping this down, and I'm again, I start, in this case, usually start from one side and work across the other side. And in a channel like this that I'm going to leave open, it's going to move differently over air than it does over the stone. So you have to keep that in mind. And you have to keep working this area back because it'll want to flare out. So you keep working it back and go evenly across. And I'm pushing the metal down and widening it out. So it's coming over the stone and it's working out a little bit, doing both those things. I'm going to go back in there, file the top down, and file this inside ledge away to open up that area again. When you're holding your rod that you're tapping with, it's up, it looks like you're holding it at an angle. Oh, I'm just showing you the rod. Okay, when you put it down, it's straight and flat. And there's a drawing in your hand, okay. The punch um, is, is, is the heel, you said it's a softened rectangle. Oh, just the edges are softened on it. It's not, it's not a harsh, so sharp not rectangle. Sharp. Oh, not as in, not a nail soft. Right. Oh. I'll file the top down and I'll file this inside edge away. At an angle, at a bevel. Because it's working its way over the stone, I've got to work it back. Maybe it'll make sense to the bevel. Maybe one more? Maybe one more? Oh, you can see the soft, what I'm talking about, there's a soft yeah. rectangle there. Mm -hmm. There I am filing the top down with a nice big file. See, I am so secure about the fact that the table of that stone is down on uh, the top of it. <laughs> <laughs> here's the barrette file, and here's the angle that I'm going to hold it to file that inside ledge away. Mm. I'm going to bring it down in front and file that edge to a bevel. <coughs> So I'm just going to go through this as quickly as possible because it would be nice to do a different setting as well, not just the channel. Unless, do people want me to do the channel or do you want me to do something else? Do the channel too. And I'll do tubes, okay. So Jeffrey, you're just going to have to tell me if you just can't see anything. It's hard to focus close up, but we'll mm -hmm. get... Now usually when I'm doing a channel setting, you know, I've, I've had a good night's sleep <laughs> and I feel really good. I've spilled my wine to the solder gods and goddesses and it's a good day. Obviously some of those things aren't operating here now, so please bear with me. made my mark on the inside. Now I'm going to have good old A and B stone. I'm going to get two stones the same color. How much room do you plan for there being between the culet and, and the base of the channel? You can set them so that the culet's almost touching the base of the channel. <coughs> So now I'm marking A and B. My stones are sitting in front of A and B. Who knows if they'll stay there. We'll do the best we can to keep them there. I'm going to take a little bit of brown wax and rub it across the top walls because I'm going to place my stones up there and they're going to roll away a lot. Now this channel may be a little bit too open and if that's the case, you can just close the channel walls down. Just this big fat pair of <laughs> <laughs> These are great pliers. <laughs> These are the pliers that I was talking about if anybody wants to cast them around. <coughs> Okay, I don't know if you can see this. My fingers are probably in the way. 
I think channel setting is one of those things that's really graceful to watch or do while people are watching. Uh, not like tube setting. Tube setting is, you know, really graceful. So what's happening is that my channel walls and my stone almost match, right? So if I get this stone off a little bit while I'm trying to put it in, it falls into the crack. Okay. The thing that's wrong with Robert Williams' videos is that he doesn't make any mistakes. Yeah. So that you don't know what to do. I mean, not you know, like dropping a stone, but it's sort of nice to see when things don't always go perfectly. Yeah. I feel like calling him and saying, do you really make any mistakes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> The most important thing that I've learned with this setting is to make these culet marks exactly right. And the reason is that you have the two walls to cut, and if your cuts don't line up on either wall, your stone is not going to go in. You have to have them across from each other exactly. Can you see what I'm doing? Probably better than I can see what I'm doing. What are you using the marker for? The dividers. I have these really sharp, what are these, drafting dividers? I like these for marking stones because they have really sharp points and they're little. You know. Okay. Now, you know about calipers, right? A pair of plastic calipers. Everybody tells you don't buy these cheap plastic calipers because the legs will always break off on this side. You can never measure the inside of anything anymore. But I found that if you have metal ones, they mark up the, the metal that you're measuring. So if you have metal calipers and you're trying to measure something in silver, you'll have all these scratch lines on the silver. So I stick with my poor broken old plastic calipers. <laughs> I was measuring the size of my heart burr, and it was a little bit bigger than I wanted for my first cut. So I'm going to um, put in a smaller heart burr. My heart burr's coming in my ears now. I love heart burrs. Why do I use this instead of a setting burr? A setting burr wouldn't fit into, wouldn't create that notch in the channel wall that I want for the stone to sit in. It would take away too much material. Because the angle, if you angle that setting burr in there, the angle is greater than the edge of this angle. Um, so I'm just going to charge it with a little wax, and then I'm going to have to get really close to what I'm doing. So if you can't see it, I apologize, but it's important that I see it, right? Yeah. <laughs> now I'm going to go down and mark where the culet is on that channel line. Make that little cross that I have to follow when I cut. stone setting, I'm sure that you know the value of having a foot pedal reestat that goes really slowly. Right? There's no other way that I know of to do a lot of stone setting. So I'm using something, oh Andy knows the name of this. It comes with the auto flex, flexible shaft setup from um, Frying Burrell, which is a company I like to do business with, but I guess I shouldn't say that. Rio Grande's fine too. Uh, but they have this very special, this isn't the fork, this isn't the <coughs> flex shaft, but the foot pedal, and some of you might want to come up and try the foot pedal. It's a really fabulous foot pedal. Um, the control is just beautiful. And I spend money on my foot pedals as opposed to my flex shafts. You want to go very slowly in the beginning.
Andy Cooperman's the one who talked me into that autoplex. So. <coughs> so all I'm doing. You're not clear at the bottom with that curve. You're just going down as far as you can go. Is that? What do you mean? I'm just oh, laying on the line. Oh, I'm going into the wall. Okay. And I'm just just making a mark and to that, catch my and second. And that bar. line should be at the uh, girdle of the stone. Right. Okay. Can you see it at all? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have to keep cleaning this channel out because it's really hard to see what's going on in there. If you buy a, a Harper New and it seems to be extra sharp, I usually charge those with the microcrystalline wax as opposed to the burr life because it tends to clog it a little bit more in the beginning and you end up with your burr not overcutting. And the other thing is that you want a hand piece that turns straight and doesn't rock around. And you want to make sure your burr shaft is straight because it makes a huge difference in stone setting. If this hand piece can't hold a burr shaft straight, your burr is going to be moving all over the place and you're not going to be able to cut a good seat. And I think these number 30 hand pieces have a very short lifespan in those terms. Um, but I don't use the collet ones that Handy uses, so people might ask him about it if you want more information about hand pieces. I haven't gotten used to those yet, but these number 30 hand pieces seem to get out of alignment if they're under heavy duty use. So I have a stone setting flexible shaft and I have everything else flexible shaft because I don't want them to be used on grinding and pushing and, you know, those processes that can get them out of alignment. When you did that, were you cutting both sides of the channel at the same time? No. No, I cut each individual seat. I did the whole thing, but I cut all four cuts. Okay. And they're four separate cuts. And that's what's different than wooding. Wooding will do both sides at the same time. But removes part of the top of this side in the process, and then you gotta hammer it back. I'd rather leave it there. <coughs> okay, this is my larger burr. And it just fits in there, and sometimes it does sort of hit the other side, and you might have to do some cleanup. And it doesn't make a lovely noise. Can you see it? Hmm? Yeah. Boy, isn't video incredible? everyone crazy? My husband would have left the room and gone downtown, gone out for a beer at this point. He can't take that at all. Now that can happen. And that's why going slowly, having the right kind of burr, and spilling that wine is really important. I'm not doing that. Test this out. I think they're not deep enough. For this. Okay, so this is the part where you really want a desk with a tray because I'm probably going to lose these stones. I have to tell you right now. I'm going to try really hard not to. Put the stone in one side and And it should go in the cut and rock down and snap into the other side. And I don't think I can hold this exactly right for you, Jennifer, at this point. I have That's to all right. Just fiddle with it. Okay. Oh, 
pull it back a little bit to see the big picture. Oh, I see what the problem is. I'm going to have to cut a bigger seat because I didn't check my girdles out. And they are huge. Cheap stalls. So you just go a little deeper? Is that your kind of I'm going to go a little deeper, a little wider. What were you pushing the stalk in with? That's called, uh, that's just the micro crystalline wax on the end of the rod. It's just called a wax stick. That's what I mean by wax stick. And you just uh, put a bunch of microcrystalline on the end of a rod and keep it in the coldest spot you can find. These lights are not helping. So it melts all over the stone if you don't. And it's a nice thing to pick stones up with. to um, go through your walls if you have thin walls. You can cut too deeply and go right through the wall. Oh, Marsha said her hinge didn't work either. Hmm? It's even quiet now. There's nobody mowing the lawn. Or holding moving his breath. <laughs> the guy outside mowing lawns, holding his breath. <laughs> oh, ah, so close, but so far. Do you have to so put some pressure on that? Yes, you do have to put some pressure on it. Not too much. Well, you're not supposed to have to put too much. Okay, so this is, this is actually really good and very close. And all I have to do is take it out and take my little file and remove a little metal from the inside here. If you snap, snap it in to get it in, you can't get it out now. Well, I didn't snap it in. Oh, you didn't. It's not. If there's, if you screw up those, there are mechanisms for adjustment, and if you don't get the cuts just right, you mean if you snap it in and you didn't get your cuts just yeah. right? Yeah. Well. <laughs> what have you done in that case, Andy? <laughs> what have you done in that case? You know what? When I was at Revere, needless to say, when I was at Revere, I, of course, got it stuck. And um, when I asked... Um, Keith, how you get it out? And he says, oh, you just take a big metal rod and stick it in there and pop it out. <laughs> so he took a rod and stuck it in there and popped it out. Nothing happened to the stone. I put a rod in there, stuck it in, and popped half the stone out. <laughs> <laughs> what you do is you try to uh, do everything right the first time, I guess. What you do is you set that one aside, you do a second one, and you claim that was the first one. <laughs> but I can't do that because everybody's watching. Oh, we're so close. And this is going to be so good when it gets in there, too. That's called giving yourself a pep talk. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's just not clearing the top edge. That's what's going on. So sometimes, and this is quite common, your walls are warped. So if my top goes like this as opposed to straight, 
then it's not going to clear that top edge, but there's room for it right below. So I'm checking that out by filing a little bit of that top edge away. And the trick is really that this side has to be undercut enough for the stone to clear the other side. So I have to figure out where the problem is arising from. And hopefully this won't take too much longer, but my thought is, is one side undercut further than the other? No, um, not in this technique. to be in this technique and the stone wants to sit right in the middle. The idea is the stone wants to sit right in the middle and not towards one side or the other. Now I like this Delwin rod as my, uh, my wax stick because it's a nice rod to use to push the stone. So Delrin is a type of plastic that can be used for hammers and for, um, for chasing tools. And you can buy it scrap at places like Layered Plastic, those of you who are local. We're going to give this about two more minutes, and then I'm just going to go on to another setting and try this again when the light's better or something. we got to find something to blame it on. Mm. Oh, did you hear that? I heard it. <laughs> See if you threaten me. <laughs> two more minutes. Okay, let's do the other one. <laughs> myself seats that are too big and I did that because we got to a point where I had to get the stone in. If this were in the studio and I was working on this I would take the time to just cut a little bit at a time to get that perfect amount of seat because the bigger the seat is the more slop you have in the stone it rolls around in there it's hard to get set just right so this isn't my studio so we took a little shortcut We gotta threaten this one too, huh? Too many for you. <coughs> so, what else do people want to see? They want to see something other than tubing. Does anybody cut prongs with Harpers? people? People want to see cutting prongs with Harper's? No? Okay. You want to see tubes, I know. We're going to do tubes. I promise you tubes. It says that you should be able to do this with your fingernail.
the next step, and I'm just going to kind of go through these quickly. I'm not going to actually finish the setting because I think you can see how to do it. Squeeze it in, and you would line these. These are my parallel jaw pliers that are quite heat up, but you line them. You squeeze all the way across. Make sure that your two channel walls are even, even where there isn't a stone. Are you touching on the edge, the corners, and the side? Mm hmm. Right at the top. You turn it. Oops. Wow. Squish it in first. Well. <laughs> you use a kind of gentleness that I haven't exhibited today. Geez, they're even just almost next to each other. And then you want to set it up, you know, most of the time you do it on a ring mandrel. Uh, I just brought a vise and I would normally line this with some leather and set it up like this with a wedge. It's really important to have a wedge if you're not going to use a ring mandrel. And to tell you the truth, I like using these things, but you need a wedge, something to hold the back inside of the ring up through here. And then I'm going to show you my series of tapping tools. Um, how best to hold these? Can you see their ends? You made those? Yeah. yeah. This is made from tool rod stock, and I make a lot of my own tools from O1, which is oil hardening, tool rod stock, or drill rod stock. And if anybody's interested in making tools, I can discuss it later. Um, but I like to make exactly, I like to make my tapping tools and my planishing tools. Um, I like to make different sizes for different applications, so if I'm doing, you know, chasing on a, on a channel, I'll have maybe a wider one for a wider channel, a narrow one for a narrow channel, so. And the process would be going across, you probably can't see, let's see, I'll do it this way, like this. You start right in the center? No, I start from one side. Not in the center. See. Yeah. yeah. Can you see? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not actually going to do it, I'm just going to pantomime it. Although Andy gave me a wedge. And you do have to keep in mind the toughness and the hardness of your stones when you're doing this. And your goal is to get, get it down as much as possible without cracking the stones. So I start at one side and right in the middle. Um, sometimes, and in my handouts, I mentioned starting out here and going across like that. And if you feel like the stones need some more security that way, you need to pinch them in more, you can do that. So you would start out this way and go across right on the outside edge. You can see that. And then from the top, across. And my theory behind this is that more, over, more layers, less pressure. So what I tend to do is instead of hammering really hard, I tend to just tap lightly and keep going over and over and over again. And I can control the metal a lot better that way. And then when that's done, I take the file, because I know for sure the tops of my stones are down below the top of this, and I file it away. File the outsides, and then take the barrette file. And I have a safety edge on my barrette file. Can you see that at all? I've taken the side of the file and I've run it across several grits of sandpaper down to a fine sandpaper and then onto something called 4 aught polishing paper on a nice flat surface like this and put a real clean shiny edge on it, which I can run across the top of the stones if they are certain stones. And then I can file that inside bevel. And then just polish away with this hard pressed felt right on the top. Because some of these stones don't like to be hit with polishing compounds, so I don't tend to take the top of this to a polishing motor. I tend to do it by hand so that I can keep that polishing compound and pressure only, only on the outside channel wall. So, shall we do 2B? Shall we just march on? We have 15 minutes, right? Is that true? Half an hour? Yeah. Oh, great.